that what I say might be beneficial to to you for what you need from this. Um, and not. Let us begin. The, the, our idea was to gather today was to pull together some of the themes that were partially developed in the talks you heard and kind of wrap it together into a whole around some of the themes we hope to develop in the conference at large. Um, in the course of this, I hope that some of the questions that you asked or didn't ask will be answered. I hope that some of the questions you only sort of partially have formulated will be clearer to you so you can ask them. And so after we have this talk, we'll follow, follow this up with a question and answer session with some of the other adults. Um, and we'll invite you to either ask new questions. We also have still some of the questions that you've asked before available to you. So I want to start with, I'm going to get this door out of the way. I want to start with something that came from Professor Novus's talk, where he spoke about the parts of the soul as understood by, by Greek philosophy. And does anyone remember what those three parts were? Yes? So, so those are the I really imagine the opposite order that he had, and he discussed how these three parts of the soul are things that you develop through various exercises. He talked about how you had to develop yes. I'm going to yes. Oh. How, you, how, how you had to develop this first, at least to this, at least to this. I'm going to place that in a broader context, but first I want to say briefly what these things are. Okay. Um, as Professor Nova said, that the appetite of heart is the part of our soul we share with the plant. It's the part that, it's at the level of desire. And the better, probably the easiest way to think of this is it's, it's, it's what we want, what we long for, our desires. It's kind of our, our feelings lie in this area. The irascible part is, has to do with our zeal, our willpower, our ability to get angry, to really get excited about a cause. It's our ability to put aside our immediate feelings, our immediate desires, for something that we feel stronger about. Maybe that's a kind of a, a bigger element of our soul. You can call it zeal. You can also call it willpower. It's a good modern term. And then the rational part is our ability to think, to reason, to figure things out, um, kind of that higher cognitive part of our soul. The co broader context I want to put this in, though, is that the soul is not all of the human being. All of this is just your soul. But the soul, the, the human being, also has a three-part nature. The soul is one part, there's also the spirit. There's the soul, and there's the body. And all of those are important parts of what it is to be human. All of those are created by God good and redeemed by Christ. And there's, there's a natural hierarchy in this, because the spirit is the part that knows God directly, that connects with God, that experiences and knows God. And the spirit is meant to govern the soul and the body. But the spirit is itself governed by God. So this is a picture of who you are as you were created. Part one of the question of who you are. <coughs> who you are as created as created in the image of God. So with God's power, God gives the power to your spirit to govern the rest of you so that you can reason accurately. Your thoughts are not befuddled and muddy. They're, 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 they're clear. So that you can have a strong will for good. You have the power to do what you know is right what you want. And that your desires are for things that are good for you and good for others. All that's kind of in order. And your body serves your soul. Your body is a vehicle to help your soul do what is good. So that's you as created by God. 
Is that what you feel like right now? Everything's in order. You're in control of yourself. If, you, if you're paying attention to yourself, you're not going to say yes to that, right? You're going to say no. Well, why? Who knows? Why aren't we as free by God yet? Yeah. Because we don't have the connection with the Spirit to God. Yes, yes. This connection right here was broken. When was it broken? At the fall. At the fall, yes. Because why? Because we said, I don't want that connection. We said, I can do this myself. I can do it my way. Our spirit said, I want to be in charge. So we broke that connection. But that connection is not just a connection of authority. It's a connection of power. Not in the sense that you use the word power in your English class in school, of like someone exerting domination over something, but in the sense of strength, in the sense of the ability to do anything, we lose that. And so when the spirit loses its connection to God, the spirit really loses the ability to govern you. That, by the way, is what death means. In Genesis, when Adam and Eve are in the garden, and there's that tree over there, right? And God tells Adam, if you eat of the fruit of that tree, you shall surely what? Die. He was telling the truth. He was saying what would happen. Death is separation of that which is meant to be together. That's what it means. What is our physical death that happens to all of us sometime in the next 100 years? The separation between the soul and the body. The separation right here. That's the last possible separation on this link, right? Where's the first separation? That's the first death. So this death of the soul happened right away when man deliberately did that. The natural consequence later on is the death of the body as well. This separation of what's meant to be together. There's a disintegration. Separation. We're meant to be whole, meant to be together, meant to be united. To experience a wholeness. And that's not what's happening now because of this fall. So what happens? There isn't this source of power, this source of keeping things in order, our, our, our whole being becomes like an army without a general. So now, <clears throat> the mind just starts doing whatever it feels like doing with no direction. The will loses all of its strength. Lack of willpower is a huge problem in today's society, right? We do that all the time. Our desires, they're all over the place. We desire this and that and this and that. I, I, I read in a book called The Way of the Ascetics, we live in a state of thrall. Basically meaning, whatever comes into our mind, we just do it immediately. Then the next thing, then the next thing, then the next thing, until life is done, essentially wasted. So we're just, we're just a, a disordered mess, and if you pay any attention <laughs> to what you feel inside, you see that in yourself. You're a disordered mess. Your thoughts and your feelings are everywhere. <clears throat> Which, by the way, is why we try to entertain ourselves with so many things, because we don't want to look at what's inside ourselves. So, so that's kind of where we are in the fall. But is that the end of the story? Is that where we all are now? Oh, what happens next? Before the second coming, we have to have what? The first. The first coming. Okay. Second coming is going to come. Yes. But first is the first coming. So, so there's this part three of who we are. Who we, we said who we are as created, who we are as fallen, who we are as redeemed by Christ. What happens next? So Professor Novus spoke about how we can kind of work on developing, on uh, developing our, the appetitive part of our soul and working on our desires through various exercises. And working on our will through various exercises. Working on our reason through various exercises. These exercises exist in the church. And I don't want to get into that right now. Unless you ask questions, we'll address it later. But there are specific things you can do. But 
All of that is fruitless if we try to do it ourselves because we don't have that source of strength. And that's why all these beautifully designed pagan systems throughout the world, these philosophies, don't ultimately work. They get you to a certain point and then it falls down again because you don't have that source of strength. There's a limited source of strength because we are made in the image of God. You know how like when you have a tree and you cut off a branch, it's still like the leaves still stay green for a little bit of time? Is that, but then it dries up. We dry up and have the source of strength. So we need this, this reconnected. How's that happen? How is it reconnected? The sacraments, and before the sacraments, what makes the sacraments possible? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doing what? The incarnation. The incarnation. Christ becomes a man. God becomes a man in Christ. He teaches us. He works miracles. He dies. He rises from the dead. He ascends into heaven. He sends the Holy Spirit. And he comes again in the second coming. All of that is for this purpose, and this is the purpose it's for. It's not just a mythology. It's to fix us. It's to heal us. And in the sacraments, we unite ourselves to Christ and we absorb that into ourselves. So that we can be what? Not just balanced. Right? Some of the, the pagan systems sought sought for balance. We want not just balance, but reintegration. We want wholeness. Who knows the Russian word for chastity? Sila Mudriya. Sila Mudriya. Russian word for chastity. What does that literally mean? Sila Mudriya. Yes. Wholeness, don't. Yeah. Wholeness of mind. Yeah. yeah. Wholeness of mind. It means integration, completion, wholeness. Chastity is kind of a lame translation, isn't it? But that gives us an idea of what we're talking about now. We're aiming for this wholeness where we feel one. And that's what the Incarnation and the Sacraments can bring for us. Here, Father Michael walks in just in time, as I'm about to quote him here. Um, <laughs> Father Michael said, only here can we experience the quality and permanence of human satisfaction and joy. This is the one. Um, a side note here. This is why many of the beautiful-sounding pagan systems, other religions, such as Hinduism, Buddhism, all these things that do work on, on our soul and, and, and our divisions and kind of bring us back together in you know, meditation they might teach you in school, right? It makes you feel calmer inside. It kind of brings you together. But there's a danger in it because what are you doing? You're trying to bring yourself together without doing what? Reconnecting God. Without reconnecting, right? And so one of two things happens. One, best case, you fail. Worst case, you experience some degree of success and feel good about it. And then your spirit feels, aha, I got it taken care of, I'm in charge. And without this, and you become a demon. God gave us death, all of this, all this inability to control ourselves. He cut that off so that we wouldn't become what the devil is. Okay. So we're redeemed. And inside you're thinking, okay, I'm redeemed. I don't feel like it. I feel pretty fallen. I still feel my desire is running from this to that to this to that. I have no control over what I'm going to do next. I live in this, this state of just, oh, I feel like eating a cracker now. Before you even decide to, you're already eating a cracker. <laughs> yes? Right? Okay? Um, and so on and so forth. If you pay attention to the thoughts in your head, it's a rambling, amazing mess. Depressing thoughts, anxious thoughts. Thoughts of, oh gosh, what is that person thinking about me? <laughs> and on, and on, and on, and on, and on, you can't stop it. 
that too is part of God's plan. It has to do with the fact that, remember, we, we, we got that connection ourselves. We did it on purpose. So he puts the band-aid on, ties it back together, but you think we're going to let it stay on? We're stubborn. We're still proud. We want it. We're both disconnected again. And so he makes it a very slow, long process of complete healing. He's healed. He's healed that. He's redone that connection in himself, in his life, in Christ. We have to reestablish it in ourselves over the period of our entire life. And that <coughs> is the only thing your life is for. That's the purpose of your life. However long it's going to be, it's so that you can do that. So you can stop being stubborn and let him heal you. That's why I'm here. That's why you're here. We're all, we all have this goal in front of us. And that is the only purpose of the church. That's why the church is here. Everything we do in church, whether it's the candles, whether it's the incense, whether it's the fancy vestments, whether it's the prayers we say, the fasting, the services, it all is specifically for that purpose of helping you over the course of your life get here. Madhushka Elizabeth in her talk spoke about what's the answer to what we need to do. Just live the life of Christ. Right? That's the answer. Um, so there's this path the church gives us. And there's this overall outline that's the same for all of us, but the individual particulars of your path and your path and your path and your path and your path, and your path are not going to be the same. Everyone is in a different place, and the Lord is leading us to him in a different way. There's a there's an image, credit Father Michael on this again. Um, this comes from the writing of St. John um, of the Lab. And he, he, he likens the world to the spokes of a bicycle wheel. Actually, I guess it wasn't the bicycle in the bicycle, but a wheel of some sort. Why? Or a wagon. Uh, so the spokes of a wheel. And you can imagine all of us as living on these spokes. And so then this spoke is my path to God. What happens as I come closer to God and you come closer to God? We all get closer. We all get closer. So this unification, this integration happens not only within you, but also between as a result of this. But this path, I, I was telling someone yesterday this analogy that I like to use for our path in life. We would like it if on our complicated path in life, which by the way is complicated not because God's complicated, but because what? We're complicated. This path through this little tangled forest, we'd like God to turn on the overhead lights, just like I turn on the light in the morning and wake you up, um, as we can see the whole path. But instead, he gives us a flashlight. So we can see two steps ahead of us. <clears throat> and so going through this, obeying the commandments, saying your prayers, getting counsel to help you, and see the next step on your path. Not trusting your thoughts and reasonings too much, because remember that they're, they're disordered, they're broken. They're all over the place. Not trusting your feelings and your desire is too much, because they're all over the place. Things, they, they, they're transient, they come and go. Like this feels, makes you feel good for now, and then it stops doing that, something else does. Just because you feel something doesn't make it permanent, doesn't make it part of you. Um, there's another diagram, one of my favorite. If that's you, that's yourself. For many of us, we can't even see that, it's so hidden under these layers and layers and layers of stuff we built on top of it. What can be called the ego. Builds of our thoughts. Builds of our feelings. And we construct that, we look at that and we say, oh, that's me. That's my identity. But so much of that is stuff you just build up around what is you. And it changes. So part of part of our task is to try to try to look deeper and see 
way down to our self is, which we'll see only in Christ. This question of gender and sex and all that came up was one of our topics. How does what I just said have to do with that? Where does that fit into all of this? So the first thing I'll do is there's two parts to this really. One part is this question of masculine versus feminine, and the other is this, this question of the hypersexuality of our culture. I want to take those one at a time. Okay. So this notion first of masculine and feminine, male and female. Um, so, Professor Novus explained his, his explanation of how this stereotyped versions of what it is to be masculine and feminine emerge in our culture. I'm not going to repeat that. Um, but just to say, we do have and have built up, yes, we have built up in our culture this stereotype of masculine and feminine, G.I. Joe and Harvey. Right? Um, and then there's this vision. Of, of that's what male and female are, and then what happens? If you don't feel like you fit into one of those boxes, or you don't feel like you fit into the box that you are supposed to be in, then you say, oh, there's something wrong with me, my identity must be something different. And that's part of where the LGBTQ, etc., comes from, saying, well, I don't fit into that box. I must identify as lesbian, as gay, as bisexual, as, as trans, right? All these things come from not fitting into what are already a stereotype false pictures of what male and female are. The second thing that happens is this bit he mentioned is this postmodern reaction to that. They're saying, well, we don't like those stereotypes, let's build the opposite. Then you get the, the Ray figure from Star Wars, the very strong female trying almost as if it's presenting an alternative to be a man. And you get the male figures that are presented as very weak in reaction. What's the answer? What's the what's the what's the what's our actual answer yet? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> the way I understood it, at least, and I mean, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, is that most of the world around us is created as sort of a a language, if you will, a way of expressing our like expressing like to other beings, like God and other humans, and so through things like we have certain things that are innate to us, like man and woman, and we can use. We can use sort of the, na the nature of those to express who, like who we are, but those can ch the things that express can change. But the core, like the the main idea, is just that you have love and kindness and God, and like you don't break the nature of what it is. Then everything it's very sort of 
loose, but there's definitely like certainly defined boundaries, right? Like, like the, uh, Professor Noah's brought up the idea that men aren't allowed to cry, but obviously, as a work searches, we like that in society at the time, obviously we don't believe that. Like, and there's no like in Orthodox Christianity, there's no set like the church now. I, as far as I know, the church never said that men have to do this job in society or women have to do this because that changes with each culture and society and how they express themselves and how they build themselves up around God. Or right. So there are aspects of being male and female are real things. There are different bodies. There are different different brains. There's slightly slight differences and therefore there is these emphases. But both are meant to be a whole um, I'll cite Father Michael once again, um, with, he gave this beautiful reference to the lives of the saints. So, part of being a full, complete person is to have both, both courage and purity. Those are both part of what makes us whole inside. Well, courage is a traditionally male virtue. You look for that, the pagan society expected that only of men. Purity was expected in pagan society only of the women, traditional female virtue. But then look at our saints, and our male saints were exemplars of purity as well as courage. Our female martyrs were exemplars of courage as well as purity. We're both meant to be complete, while not changing the fact that we are what we are. So. Um, that's kind of a corrective on the on the male and female thing. If we have, to, yes, um, I'm somewhat uh, related to this, marriage between men and women was made in some sense, uh, as I've always like, as I've seen it, because men and women have, like after the fall have different strengths in virtues that God gave all humans, and that helps sort of unite them and balance out the faults of the other gender. That's a large part of it. Yes. And if you have further, I hope you will present further questions. I know we have some already on the list about, you know, career choices and paths in life and things like that related to being male and female. We addressed some of them yesterday already. But please ask those questions if you have them. The second part I want to address here is this, this hypersexuality of our culture. Um, again, Professor Novus gave us some background on how he, how he saw that coming in. How, how it coming from this, this search for authenticity that we have, this, this, this desire to, to be authentic, to be real, to be true to ourselves. And when you've lost, when you've become so disintegrated in yourself, you have no connection to your spirit, and no connection to God, and to this picture of who you fully are, then as he explained, you start to look for that authenticity in the part of yourself that seems strongest and most inner, which ends up being that sexual aspect, that, that, that appetite that's one of your strongest appetites you have. And so that leads to this pursuit of that as your identity. And then what happens? You're looking for satisfaction. You're looking for pleasure. You're looking for you primarily in that. But are you going to find satisfaction? Is it going to ultimately completely make you feel joyous and whole? No, because what's missing? Um, and so what do you do? When you don't find satisfaction there, you look for more and more and more different forms of it. And that's why, that's where the plus comes from in the LGBTQ plus. There's more and more, and we're looking for more because we don't get satisfied. And the culture doesn't get satisfied. It adds more and more people are still looking in it. And that's where we go, right? That's where the culture goes. This finding pleasure in that kind of in, in sexual activity is natural, right? It's going to happen in almost any kind of activity that we're doing. But we have to see that in ourselves, just because we feel something right now, just because we think something right now, doesn't mean it's who we are. Back to this stuff we kind of build on top, stuff that the culture gives us, stuff we just momentary feelings that pass, thoughts and feelings come from lots of different sources. 
and they pass away. So it's not at all surprising that anyone in this room could have those kinds of thoughts and feelings. We shouldn't berate ourselves for them. We should realize they're not part of us. They are just something that we're experiencing. Right. The word that I approach to thoughts is generally to watch them from a distance. Say, oh, there's this thought coming in. Hmm. <laughs> and go on. And, and if, we, if it's a thought that is tempting that we know we shouldn't entertain, we'll run to God to help us with that, right? And so that leads to a lot of the problems that we have and a lot of the it is part of this disordered nature, this disordered situation that we're in. To which the answer is, what do we do? How do we heal ourselves? Pray. Sacraments. Sacraments. Christ. Christ, yes. Through Christ, yes. Humility. Humility. Fasting. takes two different people and brings them together. And um, to Father Daniel says this, that he said, one plus one equals one. In marriage, one plus one equals one. Um, so it's God's plan for our wholeness. And it's marriage is this abiding, very deep, very fundamental unity that lasts forever. That's what it's meant to be, this uniting of one and one into one. And it happens on all three levels. On the level of the spirit, on the level of the soul, and on the level of the body, which is where sexual activity comes in. And the sexual activity itself is meant to unite us. It's one of the aspects of that union happening on this level that happens together with union happening on this level in your mind, in your feelings, in your, and on the level of the spirit. So a marriage happens on all these levels. You pray together, you talk together, you do things together. Um, all of this happening together acts to integrate us. But those same physical activities taken outside of that context have the opposite effect. They disintegrate us more. Because then you're starting to have a very, very intense union when you really haven't fully committed yourself to it. And so it, it's like attaching and unattaching, which breaks and disintegrates further. Um, so I think that should provide some context to help clarify your further questions on these various topics we've discussed. So I will stop there. What I'm going to suggest is I'm going to pass out some cards. So if you have questions you want to ask anonymously, you can write those down. Okay. If you want to have ones you want to just ask directly, I guess we can do some right now, and we'll also have, when we get back together, we'll have time for questions as well. Yes? Um, okay, so you said that the slide is like, before, that on the one we strive to, to heal, right? Does that mean we're like born completely broken or something? Like, like I, I understand what you're saying, but like, where does that start? Good question, right? Sorry with Adam and Eve, right? And so, so yes, so, so, you, so you, you were born, and before you where did you come from? Your parents, right? So you were born from your parents, who were born from their parents, who were born from their parents. And I think in my further answer right now, I'm going to start to stray a little bit into my interpretation. So take this next part with a slight grain of salt. Um, I understand that what you inherit from your parents is not just your body, but also has to do with your personality and your soul and your person, including the brokenness. I mean, why do people sometimes have the same 
may, maybe a predilection to becoming an alcoholic that their parents did. Right? The same, the same temptation by anger that their parents might have. We, we, we carry these things on. We have the same struggles. So we're born in a state, we have a certain place we're starting from, and then it's our struggle to go from there. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Why does it seem like the little children, they are so much closer to God than we are as we grow up? Anybody know the answer to that? Yeah. <clears throat> they haven't had time to do a whole lot of things. Right? They haven't made many of those choices. Every choice we make has an effect on who we are, and it has an effect on how we grow, and we can grow farther away from Christ or closer to Him. And we start making a lot of choices. And if you're like me, you probably make more of the wrong choices than of the right choices. A lot of the time, right? Okay.